Hi everybody, I'm Asaf Bitterman. Um, Carlo Ratti, and you know, Asaf and I grew up in uh, two smaller cities, we, in both in Italy and, and in Israel. And then over time, we moved to bigger and bigger cities. We moved to the UK, we moved to Boston, to, to New York. You know, by doing this, we actually discovered something quite exciting. That, you know, like today, a great city is a place where you have a lot of people, a lot of excitement, a lot of buzz, and a lot of ideas. But at the same time, it's also a city where you've got a lot of issues. You've got uh, pollution, you've got uh, a lot of traffic jams. You know, this is nothing new. Uh, Louis Mumford, who was one of the greatest urban scholars of the past century, he used to say the city is both heaven and hell. It is heaven because, you know, the city is this place where we can all come together, exchange ideas, and really be richer. Uh, but uh, at the same time, it's also hell because uh, the city is a place where, again, you know, we got a lot of cars, a lot of traffic, and a lot of infrastructure issues. So what Asaf and I have been doing over the past few years at MIT at the Sensible City Lab is really look at how digital technologies are changing the way we understand cities, but also we can transform them. Today, you know, digital technologies are entering physical space. It's what many people call Internet of Things, or ubiquitous computing. It's about like computing entering everywhere and changing the way we change our envir the environment outside ourselves. And so one of the things I want to share with you today is how this could radically impact mobility in cities over the next decades. Now, if you look at this, the first thing I want to share with you is, can we have fewer cars and more humans? Look at this. Here you've got every dot here on the image is a taxi pickup or a drop-off. What you see here is JFK Airport in New York. Then you zoom out, you see all of Manhattan and the boroughs. Then you can ask yourself, these days we love to share. We love to share everything, like you know, apartments and rooms on Airbnb. So what if we could share mobility? And then if you look at two points over there, between those two points you've got 220,000 trips every year between any two points in, in Manhattan. So we ask ourselves, you know, what if we could take everybody to destination, but if people could share mobility, what would be the minimum number of cars? Now, when you've got big data to analyze, then sometimes you need big mathematics or new mathematics. Here we looked at uh, uh, using network science in, or in order to answer that question. And you see the results over here. The results are that actually quite stunning. That in New York, you could take everybody to destination when they need to be there, but with 40% less infrastructure, 40% less cars and pollution than, than what we have today. Now, that is about you know, how we can share mobility, but we can also share not only the ride, but the car itself. And what you see here is actually a self-driving car. The two little ears are like two little eyes, similar to the human eye, that allow the car to create a 3D model of the environment. And the exciting thing about self-driving, you know, it's not that you don't need to keep your hands on the steering wheel or that you can shamelessly text while driving. But the exciting thing is that with self-driving, the car can give you a lift in the morning when you go to the office, and then can give a lift to somebody else in your family, or to anybody else in the city. You know, if you combine this thing with what I said before about sharing the ride with sharing the car, the combination of the two really means a city where we can take everybody to destination, but just with 20% of the cars we have today. And think about how different New York would be if it were to remove eight cars out of 10. Thanks, Carlo. So we can have fewer cars, but what about human-powered mobility? People throughout the world are searching for new ways to move through their cities powered by their body. Cycling is one great example. Biking uh, for commuting is on a rapid rise throughout the world. Bike-sharing systems appear in cities everywhere. In fact, in mid-2014, last year, there were more than 600 cities with bike-sharing systems in 49 different countries. But there's a fundamental problem with all of this. <clears throat> Sorry. There's a fundamental problem with all of this. The sheer scale of our cities has dramatically changed over the past 100 years. Now look at London, for example, and how it evolved over the centuries from the mid-1500s. You see it till 1850, through the Industrial Revolution, and then with the introduction of the car and underground rail, look at how the city expanded all the way to the mid-1960s. The sheer scale of our cities today makes it so that it is almost impossible for the average person to move through them without motorized transport. In fact, we've studied this and we've observed that when it comes to cycling, once you go more than 15 kilometers, so roughly nine miles between home and work, there's a big decrease in the amount of cycling. 
Hills are also a big deterrent for people to jump on a bike on a regular basis. So to tackle this, we, devi uh, we developed a robot, a standalone wheel that you can put on any bicycle and it enhances your body, it expands, it expands its capacity. We call it the Copenhagen wheel. It was developed initially at our lab at MIT and now it's spun off into a startup called Super Pedestrian. Inside the wheel, there's a motor, which is also a generator, a set of batteries, about 12 different sensors and three little computers. When you pedal, the wheel figures out what you do with your feet, the most minute motions, and then it imitates you, making you eight to ten times stronger. When you backpedal, it slows you down and charges your batteries with the energy it collects. You control the wheel with your phone, so you can lock and unlock it, you can customize your ride as you move around, and you can receive information about your physical activity. You also collect information about the environment you ride through so you can share it with friends and other cyclists. Here's an example of a ride taken with a Copenhagen wheel with a little camera in the back. So you pedal on this just like you use a regular bike, but the sensation is almost like the ground shrunk underneath you or that a hill disappeared. Or if you think otherwise, uh, like you became Superman. Now, how could the future city look like? We've seen ways to dramatically reduce the number of cars by sharing trips together, by sharing ownership of a car, by combining the two. We've seen ways to, to use robotics to empower our bodies so we can cycle easily over great distances and through hills. Now, if we get inspired by what, hap by what happened here in Times Square, where we removed some cars and made more room for people, well, then you know, that's an incredible transformation of the city. And we saw here in New York. But think about you could look at this and multiply and expand it in cities all over the world. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I just had to ask a question before the two yes. of you left. What would you say is a challenge that you anticipate in implementing this new type of technology in cities? Which specific? Uh... Uh, the bicycle one. Uh, challenge for cities. Well, actually, robotics has been around for decades. Mm. The challenge is to make it small and to create that kind of delicate experience which preserves the experience of cycling as it is today on a normal bike. So when you get on this thing, and you really have to feel this, when you get on this thing, it just feels like normal cycling, but you think that you've eaten a lot of spinach or, or let's say, enhanced your performance. Yeah, I want to say, if you want to try it, actually, we got the, we got the wheel down there, so you can try it. But I wanted to add something. It's about uh, the other project. I didn't mention it before, but basically we did this work. It was published a few months ago about sharing taxes in New York. But the first results were actually two years ago. And well, you know what? Actually, they came to the attention of Uber. And since then, we started working with Uber. And as you might know, Uber Pool does exactly that. It allows you to get a car by sharing with somebody else. So in a certain sense, you know, sometimes really one of the things in order to get things implemented mm -hmm. is how then you start from an idea, from research, and from what you do in university, and bring it to the real world thanks to you know, different partners and ways. All right, thank you. Thank All you. right. Thanks a lot, everybody.